Welcome everybody to this uh, fifth summer lecture in our series for 2021. I'm delighted, especially this day, to introduce Elizabeth Yale, an historian of science and the book in Britain and Europe, working at the University of Iowa. Beth is the author of Sociable Knowledge, Natural History and the Nation in Early Modern Britain, published by the University of Pennsylvania Press in their material text series in 2016. A book that has attracted praise from every quarter. The reviewer in Renaissance Quarterly, for example, had this to say. To her wonderfully fine-grained analysis of the personal correspondence and collaborations that generated the materials of Britain's natural and national history, Beth Yale adds thought-provoking reflections on the nature of archives more generally. Yale's readers should find it impossible to use any scribal archive without following her lead in resurrecting the human connections that allowed its physical survival. Through example after engaging example, the reviewer writes, Yale invites us to find out where did this scrap of paper start? How many hands did it pass through? What favors were exchanged? Who tinkered with its form and content? How did it escape lining a pie tin, binding an account book, fueling a zealot's fire, or all the other dismal fates of countless manuscripts? And how did it reach its present home? That's high praise indeed. Beth is also general editor with Vera Keller and Anna Marie Roos of Archival Afterlives, Life, Death, and Knowledge Making in Early Modern British Scientific and Medical Archives, published by Brill Publishing in 2018. She is currently working on two projects. The first is a study of paperkeeping practices in early modern European learned households about which we'll soon hear more. The second, in collaboration with James T. Costa, is an annotated edition of Charles Darwin's 1871 publication, The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex. Beth Yale is president of the Council of Rare Book Schools, Andrew W. Mellon Society of Fellows in Critical Bibliography. Please join me in welcoming Beth Yale. Thank you, Michael, for that wonderful introduction. I haven't read any reviews in a while, so <laughs> it's nice to hear the work <laughs> described in that way. Um, and I wanna thank Laura Idem and Barbara Heritage, uh, Tess Leminski and Neil Curtis, and all of the staff at Rare Book School for inviting me here today um, to share with you some of what I've been working on with women's paperkeeping practices in learned households in 17th and 18th century Britain. Um, and I'm just excited to share with you today some of what I've been thinking about along those lines and to talk with you further in, in the chat discussion later as well. Um, I was at Rare Book School earlier this summer to take a class virtually uh, on Spanish American textual technologies and it's really wonderful to be back again. So thank you. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share screen and get that going and then we'll jump in. All right, in Europe, in the 16th through the 19th centuries, households were key sites for developing scientific, medical, and other forms of learned knowledge. In this context, I argue today, one important way women contributed to the development of science was through paperkeeping, wrangling the flow of information through the house. Women, often but not always, wives and daughters of male naturalists 
recorded experimental results and observations, archived and preserved papers, translated scientific texts, took and maintained reading notes and even read texts out loud, managed correspondence, edited, authenticated, and maintained, or edited, edited, authenticated, and even published scientific books. So today, I'd like to consider women's roles as paper keepers by tracing the itinerary of one ordinary English letter. It's an ordinary English letter, but it's in an odd place. On May 2nd, 1692, Cassandra Willoughby, a single English gentlewoman in her early 20s, wrote to her mother to share a list of plants, many of them from seeds sourced from the Caribbean West Africa, growing in the experimental physic or medicinal garden on her family's country estate. Following the letter from Cassandra's hand to its archival location in the collection of Hans Sloan, the wealthy physician whose collections kickstarted the British Museum, I traced the entanglements of family, science and medicine and economic interest in the early modern British world. Specifically, not only did Sloan, Willoughby herself, and members of her family, including the merchant Josiah Child, who's an East India merchant, profit from their investments in the Atlantic slave trade and the sugar industry, which was built on enslaved labor. But also through their paper keeping practices, they sought out and built on West African and indigenous Caribbean botanical and medical knowledge, even while erasing enslaved and free Africans as knowers. Now, and I'll show you a picture of Cassandra Willoughby, gives you a little sense of the environment in which we're dealing with in this, this talk today. Now, this is a story of women's roles in the history of science and the history of the book, as well as in the family and the broader economy in early modern Europe. Yet, yet I would argue that mine is not a story about women in science or women in the history of the book per se, if we are to understand that women's contributions to science and learning in this period were unusual or rare, or should be confined to a week of their own, perhaps in a general course on the history of, this, history of science or the history of the book. Women are woven through the story because they are part of the everyday quotidian practice of science and learning in early modern Europe. Similarly, women should be present in the stories we tell about the history of the book because they were part of the everyday quotidian processes of making, circulating, and reading printed and written texts in this time and place. And that's not to say that women were always or everywhere record keepers within the history of science as I'm gonna talk about today. This was a role that was also often filled by male amanuenses, male servants and children, as well as female wives, children, servants. Um, and we can look at gendered ways in which their participation in science in the book differed, both for men and women, but we can find them in many corners when we start to look for them. And I think it's important to incorporate them into the mainstream of the story. So I'd like to turn now to Cassandra Willoughby's letter and just as we get started, just a note on some of the places that we're gonna be talking about today to give you some orientation and geography. Um, Cassandra, at the time she writes this letter to her mother is living at a, the estate of Walliton, which is a family estate of hers. It's just outside or in Nottingham in the Northern part of England. She's writing to her mother who's at an estate in Wanstead just outside London. And the letter's also going to be passing through the East India house in London as well in the 1690s. And then when we get into telling the wider story about the connections between Cassandra's interests in botany and the transatlantic slave trade, we'll be touching down at some um, spots along the Guinea coast in what's now Sierra Leone and Guinea, um, places where the Royal African Company, which managed the British slave trade is very active. Um, and then in Jamaica as well, where Hans Sloan spent a period of time collecting botanical knowledge and information. So turning now to Cassandra's letter, here, I'd like to consider the paper, paper keeping practices through which Cassandra and her contemporaries tie together natural history, medicine, family interests, and commerce. Along the way, we'll attend to how this letter builds on and erases African and indigenous Caribbean knowledge about plants and medicine, even while Cassandra herself and members of her family personally enrich themselves through the Atlantic slave trade. In doing so, I'll pay attention to the letter itself, to Cassandra's family circumstances, the spaces the letter passes through in its journeys and its present day archival location within the correspondence of the British physician, Hans Sloan. So to the letter, I'll first give a description of it so we can get ourselves oriented. Cassandra's letter is a bifolium as was common for early modern European letters. On the recto of the first leaf, which you see here, 
Cassandra writes to her mother, Lady Emma Child, explaining the circumstances under which she compiled a catalog of plants that had survived the winter in the gardens at Woolerton, where Cassandra was living. And Cassandra herself terms this as a catalog, giving it a kind of formal status. The tone of the letter suggests that Emma had perhaps requested this catalog, that it was something that was desired by her uh, as, as, a, as a record to, that she wanted to possess. Cassandra outlined contributions to the project that had been made by her brother Thomas, their gardener, Richard Pratt, as well as a London seedsman and botanist, a man named Samuel Duty. And you see their names kind of showing up through this, this letter that I've transcribed here. Some of the plants that are listed are Caribbean or West African in origin, and the seeds were likely procured from Hans Sloan, who brought seeds home with him following his return from Jamaica in 1689, where he had served as a physician to the colonial governor there. In her letter, as you'll see here, Cassandra expresses some frustration that neither her brother Thomas nor the gardener Pratt seem to have time for the project of cataloging the plants in the garden and showing what had survived and what hadn't. She, see, she describes herself as having been forced to take the work on and cobble together the Latin names of the plants as best she could. She offered some theories about why some of the plants did not survive the winter and what their proper names and identities might be. And here she draws on her own reasoning as well as that of the gardener, Pratt, as in his knowledge. The catalog of plants she gives on the recto and verso of the second leaf, and it's just a pretty simple list of plants. I've highlighted a couple of different species that she lists. These include a capsicum siliquus recurvus propendentibus, which is a variety of Guinea pepper, which has its origins in West Africa. So a culinary or medicinal plant. Other medicinal plants such as the Suriname physic nut or Suriname physic nut, which would have had its origins possibly in the West Indies, possibly in Africa. Um, there are plants on the list that could be found at this time um, growing in Barbados and Jamaica, uh, a silk grass that was used to make uh, cloth and textiles, uh, as well as a housing material in Barbados. And then there are also showy tropical flowers. So on the second page, she lists the pride of Barbados uh, and a lily of Barbados, so plants that you might find growing in, in a garden. And the plants that survive the winter are marked with an X and perhaps unsurprisingly in a garden that had to survive uh, in the Nottinghamshire winters, not many of the Caribbean or West African plants appear to have survived, though a few of them did. And then just to complete our orientation, the direction line for this letter, which would have been visible when the letter was folded up and sealed for mailing, and you can see the folds still today, even though it's been stored open and flat for a number of years. You can see that direction line on the verso of the first leaf of the letter. And the letter is addressed, of course, to Cassandra's mother, Emma Child, at Wanstead House in Essex, where Emma lived with her second husband, Josiah Child, who is a wealthy East India Company merchant. And you can see here that the letter is meant to pass through East India House in Leadenhall Street in London before it heads to Wanstead House in Essex. This site also includes a later endorsement summarizing the contents of the letter. You'll note above the wax seal, plants growing at Sir Thomas Willoughby's in 1692. We'll examine each of these elements on the direction page in turn, but first I'd like to think about this letter in the context of Cassandra's family history and her own investments in natural history and specifically in botany and how what it would have meant to her as she's kind of generating this catalog for her mother. As the youngest daughter of Emma Child's marriage to the naturalist Francis Willoughby, an interest in the new sciences of the time period, especially natural history, was a part of Cassandra's family inheritance. In the 1660s and early 1670s, her father Francis Willoughby had partnered with the botanist John Ray to reconstruct the natural history of the world. The two traveled Britain and Europe and conducted research establishing collections of painting, printed books and manuscripts in Naturalia. When Francis died in 1672, when Cassandra was very young, basically under five, Ray continued on, completing under both their names volumes on birds, fishes, and insects, the first two lavishly illustrated with copper plate engravings financed by Emma and the fellows of the Royal Society. And you can see here an image of one of the plates from the ornithology, which Emma helped to finance. And as a kind of side note, Emma's work in financing these productions is another example of those paper keeping practices of communicating scientific knowledge. Following Cassandra's father's death, John Ray, along with his wife, Margaret, who was a servant in the Willoughby household, took responsibility for the education of Cassandra and her brothers. Cassandra and her brothers took a great deal of pride in their father's legacy, 
1687, as a teenager, Cassandra left her mother's home and moved to the Willoughby estate of Woolaton, where they constructed the physic garden and she kept her catalog of it with her elder brother, Francis. The move occurred as the siblings were pursuing a suit against their stepfather, Josiah, for control of their inheritance from their father. It was a bitter fight, turning on a dispute over whether the children's portions should continue to be invested in East India stock or less riskily, but more stably in land, with Josiah meanly nagging the siblings for every pound, shilling, and penny he had spent on their upbringing. After Francis's death in 1688, Cassandra continued at Woolaton with her brother Thomas, staying on even after his marriage in 1691. And here I think it's significant to think about sort of Cassandra's life course, that in fact, when she writes the catalog, she's in her early 20s. She moves as a teenager with her brothers to become a kind of uh, housekeeper, to, to work as a housekeeper to keep house, but involves so much more than that with her brothers. Um, she invests time with her family and caring for her nephews after her um, brother's uh, marriage, and she herself doesn't marry until she's in her 40s, right? And so maintaining a kind of independence that allows her to be involved in her family of birth in a way that she might not, not otherwise have been able to. Now, at Woolaton, when they moved there, Cassandra and her brothers, first Francis and then Thomas, embarked on a project to reestablish and care for their families, especially their father's legacy. The house had been built by their grandparents during the reign of Elizabeth I, but the family had closed up the estate after a fire in 1642. And so Cassandra and her brothers set about rebuilding the house and the gardens. First, they also transferred to Wallaton their father's collections, which included all of the natural objects, as well as his library of natural history materials and a library of literary works that dated back to the late Middle Ages. The natural history collections included metals, dried birds, fish, insects, shells, seeds, minerals, and plants and other rarities, such as the dried scaly skin of a lizard, which was about a yard long. And here you can see this is the house, right? A picture taken in 1928 of the house that they were working on rebuilding. After almost two decades of neglect, this collection needed careful conservation. Cassandra wrote, and Cassandra took part in this, Cassandra wrote that, quote, it was a vast business for us to clean, label, and put these rarities in order, which we were fain to do ourselves, fearing the servants might make mistakes and pull such tender curiosities to pieces. In 1689, Cassandra and her brother Thomas began a project to rearrange their father's botanical specimens, setting them on sheets of coarse paper interleaved into a copy of the botanist John Ray's Latin History of Plants. And then further in 1695, Cassandra began copying and writing a history from the letters, notes, and account books in her family's keeping at Wallaton, records dating back to the 1540s, which required her to learn Renaissance secretary hand and earlier medieval scripts. So to complete a kind of self-education in paleography to develop techniques and tools for doing historical work as she became a kind of family historian. And so we see across these different projects, right? The activities of paper keeping um, span natural historical interests, but they also span family history, all kind of connected by an interest in family legacy and family history. And Cassandra is acquiring as a, as a teenager and as a, as a woman in her 20s, acquiring and skillfully employing these paper keeping practices. So we can think here of the labels that she and her brother affix to the tender curiosities, the ability to handle those curiosities without further damaging them, the coarse paper specifically chosen to cushion and preserve the delicate dried plants, and the learning of uh, older hands and the archival skills that she gains in writing her family's history. So working on the garden, the physic garden was one of many little projects that Cassandra undertook during this decade of the 1690s. And we can dig a little deeper into that, that letter to understand how Cassandra is positioning herself within the family. And what I would suggest is that Cassandra's letter reflects perhaps some modest self-fashioning, which is not uncommon for women who are doing work in the sciences in this time period. She presents herself as forced to undertake the work of compiling the catalog, which would have had her crisscrossing back and forth between the garden and the library, uh, speaking with the gardener, speaking with her brother, as she compared plant specimens dead and living with descriptions and illustrations in her father's collections of natural history books. She describes herself as forced, right, as if it's unwilling, yet her descriptions of caring for her father's collections, the other projects that she undertook, suggest that she skillfully handled naturalia and that it was something that she took pleasure in and, and enjoyed doing. The library, furthermore, was of course familiar ter territory for her, increasingly familiar uh, through the 1690s as she delved into the family archives. 
Another note of modesty is when she apologizes for any mistakes in the plant names in her letter. Um, one question about we could ask about this is how much of this was likely to be false modesty? Cassandra's hesitancy here may reflect a kind of pre-Linnaean instability in plant names as much as her lack of Latin. We know that Cassandra had at least some passing familiarity with Latin nomenclature. John Ray's tutelage included requiring the Willoughby siblings to memorize names for flowers, birds, and fish in Latin. And she also would have encountered Latin botanical terminology when relabeling and rehousing her father's collections of plants. And using books to match incomplete dead or dried specimens to names challenged even those knowledgeable in Latin, especially with plants that were not native to Europe. Herbals often listed multiple names in different languages, sometimes introducing new names as they sought to pin plants down taxonomically and across cultures. What Cassandra called Pride of Barbados was likely the contemporary Dutch naturalist Maria Sibylla Marian's Flos Pavonis or Peacock Flower, also christened Quinciana Pulcherima by the French botanist Joseph Turnefort in 1694. And Hans Sloan, of course, knew it by still other names, including a name derived from Nahuatl of Tlaco Shilo Xochitl, right? So many, many different names that were possible there. And so when she apologizes for it, we can also read that as this is a difficulty that others shared in this time period. So another way in which we can understand this letter is within the context of the landed country house world that Cassandra shared with her family. And within this world, an interest in plants and gardening was also allied with cultivating pleasure and with status. Cassandra noted uh, in another letter that her brother Thomas's quote, genius led him to chiefly pursue the study of nature and more especially the nature of plants. She credited him with establishing the physic or medicinal garden at Wallaton. In all likelihood, of course, this is the garden whose plants are catalog lists. But she also cast her brother's genius in terms of enjoyment as much as study. In the garden, she wrote, he used often with pleasure to amuse himself. And she speaks of herself in similar terms, writing to her mother in 1706 about her own recreations in the Woolerton Gardens, where, book in hand, stolen from the library perhaps, she, quote, philosophized daily in a pretty little wilderness, now grown to perfection. So, for example, if a plant like Pride of Barbados, this lily, could be made to thrive at Woolerton, perhaps in a greenhouse, it would serve well for these kinds of pleasures for cultivating the pretty little wildernesses. But, and this is a turn in the talk, this is a, a chilling thought when we think about the ways in which Flos Pavonis or peacock flower was used. Uh, Maria Marion, the artist and botanist who produced this image, for example, recorded that in the Dutch colony of Suriname, where this plant could be found, Indian women used the peacock flower seeds as an abortifacient, and women of African descent threatened to, so as not to bring children into lives of slavery and mistreatment. And so kind of through the rest of the talk, I'll be exploring maybe some of those disjunctures from what can be seen in Cassandra's letter, what we know about her world and the country house world, and how this letter fits into a context of the Atlantic slave trade. In the same 1706 letter to her mother, in which Cassandra spoke of philosophizing daily in the pretty little wilderness. She compared the pleasure that she took in the Woolerton Gardens to her half-brother's recreations in his garden at the estate at Wanstead, where her mother lived. This estate had been purchased by Cassandra's stepfather, Josiah, with profits from his, his investments in the Royal African Company and a Jamaican sugar plantation, as well as in the East India trade. Overgrown, suddenly moneyed, and sordidly avaricious, as the diarist John Evelyn described him. There's Josiah Child. Josiah Child dug his money into the landscape, transforming a cursed and barren spot into a park built about with walnut trees and fish ponds. These gardens were a grand statement of his family's arrival into the English upper classes. So gardens in this time period, a physic garden like the one at Woolerton, a garden like the one at Wanstead, it's also about display, social display. And perhaps Emma Child is the recipient of this letter would have been interested in it um, for the display aspect, for the pleasure aspect, possibly also for medicines or foods that could come out of that garden as well. But nonetheless, the chill deepens. In Cassandra's world, the pleasures and displays of country house gardens were funded in part by slavery's profits. Continuing in this vein, I'd like to now read out from Cassandra's letter. What can the marks on this unfolded sheet, as well as its position in Hans Sloan's archive, Tell us not only about Cassandra's textual labors, but about the interests and concerns of the larger network in which she operated. In exploring this question, 
will bring what was latent, the letter's connections to Atlantic slavery, out into the open. And here I want to focus on the direction line um, that takes us through the East India House in Leadenhall Street. Through the direction line, we can begin to link Cassandra's botanical catalog more directly to the Royal African Company's interests in economic botany, deepening our understanding of the letter as a document with both scientific and economic value. Though Emma Child, the letter's addressee, is in residence at Wanstead House, the letter is to be left at East India House in Leadenhall Street in the city of London, presumably because Josiah Child or a servant of his would be there to pick up the letter, held with other correspondence and carry it on. And what I would argue too, is that given the evidence of the way that female family members and friends directed correspondence to each other with the intention of having a wife or a daughter share it with a male relative, that the fact that the letter is being routed through East India House to Emma Child doesn't discount the idea that Josiah Child would be expected to see this as well, that it could be a way of Cassandra sharing information with Josiah via her mother, especially given the tense relationship between Cassandra and Josiah. Child, who we met briefly, was a founding shareholder of the Royal African Company, which managed England's role in the transatlantic slave trade. And of course, he also held controlling interests in the East India Company. He was a powerful new made man and he held a great fortune estimated at as much as 200,000 pounds in the early 1680s. And he had an even greater reputa reputation for avariciousness. Child penned a discourse about trade in which he supported the expansion of sugar cultivation in Britain's Caribbean colonies in part because of the great profits the English could raise from enslaved African workers. And he was very explicit about this. Colonization might be expected to drain workers away from England, thus depleting its economy. But, wrote Child, for every quote unquote white servant, a plantation employed eight to 10 enslaved Africans. English workers provided these laborers with clothes, household goods, and building materials. Thus, quote, every English man in Barbados or Jamaica created employment for four men at home. Now, the Royal African Company, and we'll get into their archives, was interested not just in the shipment of Africans across the Atlantic as laborers, but also in their knowledge of botany and medicine. And it's in that context that we can read Cassandra's letter in Josiah Child's hands as an economic and scientific document. So perhaps Josiah opened the letter while at his office, instructed a clerk to copy the information down. At the Royal African Company, scribes and record keepers, and in this context, they're likely all male, given that this, was, that this was a public rather than a domestic setting, managed information in the service of the slave trade. Every agent that the company sent out or sent forth traveled with detailed written instructions that the scribes also copied into the record books maintained at Africa House in London. And I'll show you a page from one of those record books that we'll be talking about. The Royal African Company in their instructions to captains and to factors, their field employees, specifically instructed them to seek out plants with medical, commercial, and culinary uses, those that are like those on Cassandra's list. These included spices, such as pepper and nutmeg, dye stuffs and textiles, such as indigo and cotton, and plant-derived substances used in agriculture and manufacturing, such as potash. The company sought these plants and knowledge about how to grow and use them in various ways. They instructed their factors, their agents, to observe how West Africans used plants. So in places like what's now Sierra Leone and Guinea um, along the Cape Coast as well. They instructed the factors to enter into conversations with West Africans that they saw who were making use of plants, uh, planting or using them in medicinal ways. They instructed them to develop cordial relations with them so as to be able to obtain this knowledge. The agents were to return samples of everything to the company that they could obtain with the quote unquote best instructions that you can for how to use them. And the company also here leaned explicitly on West Africans knowledge, agricultural and botanical knowledge, their skill as plant breeders. We are sensible, for example, the Royal African Company wrote to George Coates, who is sent as a second in charge to the company's installation on York Island and the River Sherbro in Sierra Leone, that quote, great quantities of cotton may be had near you. Encourage the natives to improve the cotton as much as possible and send us what you can get, right? So there's an encouragement to rely upon 
the knowledge and the skill um, that African agriculturalists, botanists, uh, plant breeders have to develop it. Ultimately, and this is the, the, these are the instructions you see here on the slide, Ultimately, the company asked captains to bring potentially useful plants back to England for further experimental tests to see if, quote, any of them prove on trials to be beneficial or useful for either the particular or national interest. And we should note that in pursuing African plant knowledge, the company sought to profit from what historian Judith Carney has called gendered specialized knowledge systems. As Carney has established, for example, rice cultivation in West Africa was the domain of women who developed specialized skill and knowledge in judging soil fertility, selecting and planting seed, managing the growing crop and preparing rice for consumption and trade, breeding up specialized varieties of rice that worked in different environmental and climate conditions over many generations. For the 19th and much of the 20th centuries, European plant scientists denied that West Africa was an independent center of rice domestication, refusing to credit the knowledge um, that, that, that Africans, West African women had developed in this way. But what we note about the Royal African Company's record keeping around this is that the botanical expertise and knowledge of the people of Suriname, of Guinea, um, of Sierra Leone was apparent enough to the Royal African Company seeking to exploit it, to draw those plants back into England. So the plants in Cassandra's catalog fit squarely within the categories of plants sought by the Royal African Company. We see Suriname physic nut, for example, which probably originated in West Africa, but could be found growing wild in Jamaica in the 17th century. This was a purgative. It was a medicine that induced vomiting, which in the reigning humoral health paradigm of the time period was a key form of medical treatment. So for Child and his colleagues, Cassandra's letter was a record vital to the development of England's colonial interests. Through the physic garden at Wallaton, Cassandra restored her family's legacy and fashioned country house pleasures. For Josiah and his colleagues, this same physic garden was an experimental plot. Cassandra's catalog could help them assess whether potentially profitable plants could be grown in England. Finally, I'd like to turn to the letter's position in the archive of Hans Sloan. What of its position, its archival resting place? in a volume of miscellaneous letters collected in Hans Sloan's archive. It's in Sloan Manuscript 4062. What I'd like to suggest here is that when the letter was in child's hands, we see it as a kind of document with medical and economic potential and significance. And it has that significance in Sloan's hands as well. But we can also add on, as we see the letter in Sloan's hands, a kind of scientific value that's both connected to and distinct from the, the economic and medical value that it had with child. And just so we get our eyes on Hans Sloan, his portraits right here. So what other layers of significance can we glean from the letters transition into the archive? The volume in which the letter is archived, Sloan Manuscript 4062 at the British Library, includes correspondence written to Sloan, but it also includes letters from the collection of the apothecary James Pettiver whose paper Sloan inherited after Pettiver's death in 1718. Pettiver, who was something of a naturalist impresario, was also connected to the slave trade. He had a transatlantic network, uh, many of the members of which were uh, surgeons and ship's captains on um, slaving ships, uh, who supplied him with items from around the Atlantic that he published, uh, rec recorded publications about, uh, and also built up in his collections. And this is work that the historian Kathleen Murphy has done to establish the network that, that Pettiver relied upon. So Sloan may have obtained Cassandra's letter from Pettiver in some way, or he may have come into it more directly, perhaps through his ongoing interactions with the Willoughby family, whom he cultivated as patrons and clients. Uh, he had, after all, supplied the seed for the experimental garden at Woolerton, and he also gave them medical advice. Uh, he sent them recipes for exotic treats, such as a sugared cashew nuts. And he also, in fact, brokered Thomas Willoughby's, Cassandra's brothers, election to the Royal Society, the scientific and experimental society in the late 17th, early 18th century. Now Sloan, and here we'll focus again on the page with the direction line, but focusing specifically and especially on this note here at the top, the registration of the, the, the letter. Sloan mined others' letters for scholarly, economic, and medicinal value. And he regularly collected letters with which he was not in any way associated as a correspondent, which is a little bit weird if you think about it. As secretary of the Royal Society, 
Sloan always needed copy for the hungry pages of the philosophical transactions, the journal associated with the Royal Society. Some letters in his collection like this one bear endorsements noting that they had been reviewed specifically for publication and they can be matched to extracts printed in the journal. He also sought through his collecting activities to identify remedies that he could turn to account. In the best case, he profitably combined these activities. So again, linking economic and medical. For example, after he returned from Jamaica, he invested heavily in quinine, which was derived from the cinchona tree long cultivated and used by Andean Indians as a medicine. And he popularized its use in London, both through his medical practice and through articles published in the philosophical transactions. And I should say there's nothing underhanded in terms of publication practices for Sloan. He mined letters so he could print the information under the correspondence name, not his own name. So he's not stealing anyone's information, at least not his colleagues' information. Like the directors of the Royal African Company, Sloan actively collected plants and knowledge about their uses. His interests were also, again, as I said, both economic and medicinal, but with an added layer of developing systematic scientific knowledge of stabilizing the connections between names and things, right? This connection between names and things that troubled Cassandra Willoughby when she's writing her catalog and trying to match the plants to specific names. And it's also a centuries long project in which Cassandra's father, Francis Willoughby and his colleague, John Ray had been very much engaged. The plants found on Cassandra's catalog can be cross-referenced with entries in Sloan's 1696 printed catalog of Jamaican plants. Plants such as the silk grass from Barbados, which had survived the winter at Wallaton and Sloan discusses. Sloan noted that people in the Caribbean used it to make clothing and, and thread. Cassandra lists something like three varieties of peppers, which had not survived. Sloan devoted four pages to describing such peppers in his catalog of Jamaican plants, and they have many medicinal and culinary uses. Sloan, of course, listed the various names under which plants were known, drawing on French, Spanish, Portuguese, English, and Latin herbals, and natural histories from the previous two centuries of European colonization. Names with Nahuatl origins appear as well, drawn from Spanish sources. In compiling reports from printed sources, there's a great deal of uncertainty, and that's reflected in the catalog where Sloan piles up many different names and descriptions around each species. And he relied upon both his own observations as a physician in Jamaica. So again, like the Royal African Company, he is observing how indigenous people and how people of African descent use plants for medicine and manufacturing and incorporating that into his own knowledge of them. And he relies upon reports from other authors for the ways in which people of African descent and indigenous Caribbean peoples use the plants. Now, turning to that endorsement, plants growing at Sir Thomas Willoughby's in 1692, as Sloan rendered the letter useful to himself, he also participated in archival erasure of Cassandra's role in its production. To make the letter findable, Sloan or one of his amanuenses added the endorsement plants growing at Sir Thomas Willoughby's in 1692 above the direction line. Though the letters now unfolded and mounted in the guard book, the placement of the direction line suggests that the letter was stored at least initially folded up in a bundle or box. Many letters in Sloan's collection bear similar marks. When he deemed a letter valuable, he made it more easily findable. Yet the endorsement mentions only Sir Thomas Willoughby. It's important that it's his garden, but not that Cassandra was the record keeper. This is a step in a process of archival erasure, but it's not the first step through which the information in this letter has been passed. Though Cassandra Willoughby, of course, relied upon local gardeners and seedsmen's knowledge in drafting her catalog, she mentions the gardener Pratt, of course, by name, West African men and women's expertise foundational to the arrival of these plants in her garden goes unremarked. And this is perhaps unsurprising, but I think we should pause and notice it. The Royal African Company directors in their archive were aware of it well enough. It was vital to their economic interests, but it was not part of Cassandra's immediate world. And we have had to read it back in as part of the context for this letter. Archival erasures abound across the books, letters, and archival records that connected Cassandra, Willoughby, Emma Child, Hans Sloan, Josiah Child, and the Royal African Company. Unsurprisingly, in his 1696 catalog of Jamaican plants, Sloan names European language authorities, but not indigenous and African users of plants by name. Sloan's book was a step, an important step in developing accurate, precise, shared scientific nomenclature for these plants, though he worked within a system that at the time was initially used only by Europeans. Of course, now it's used and valued by scientists worldwide. But like Cassandra's letter and the Royal African Company's instructions to factors, Sloan's book propagated economically, medicinally, and scientifically valuable knowledge while partially erasing, even as he exploited the knowers. 
And here I want to note that I'm very conscious of the fact that given the archival sources that I've used for this talk, a lot of what I'm doing replicates and participates in that erasure in a way that I find difficult to escape, that I name the English participants in this network, but I'm unable to name um, the African uh, and enslaved, free and enslaved African knowers whose work contributed to creating this record. So in conclusion, attending to women's work as record keepers helps us to reconceptualize the practice of science in early modern Europe. We see that modern scientific record keeping practices emerge from households as much as from public and thus masculine institutions, such as state and royal archives, joint stock companies, universities, and learned academies. We see that these public institutions were connected in fact with physicians' libraries, with slave ships and coastal African forts, and country homes as stops on itineraries of knowledge, and that as knowledge passed from one site to the next, it took on different personal valences, different intellectual valences, economic valences within the context of the relationships between the people who received the letter. We also see that women in applying their communication and record keeping skills, their facility with paper keeping towards family interests and family projects linked themselves into economic and scientific networks that span the Atlantic. They participated in projects that profited from African and indigenous American natural agricultural and medicinal knowledge, as much as these projects profited from labor extracted through enslavement. Their work was not innocent. We cannot tell simple celebratory stories of European women in science or European women in the book. But we can come to grips more fully with the dimensions of early modern European women's lives, the interconnected economic science and scientific and medicinal value of natural knowledge and early modern paperwork as an engine that both propagated knowledge and erased knowers. Maybe Cassandra Willoughby's letter wasn't in such an odd place after all. Thanks so much, Beth, for your talk. If we can stop screen sharing, then I think we can see the group and- Oh, sure. Turn to Q&A. Let me get rid of that. There we go. Um, so thank you again for that really instructive and illuminating look into the Sloan collection and into um, these really, um, troubling archival erasures that you give voice to and for showing us, you know, how that unfolds in all of the various stages and really providing the, the scene in which that happens, um, which is you've shown is so um, multivalenced. And um, as you say, there are all these actors who are still invisible, which, which makes this um, a story that continues to need to be explored and, and researched. And, um, and, and so, um, we invite um, our those tuning in to to submit questions via the chat. I do want to kick off um, the Q and A with with one question um, that came to mind as I was listening to you and and looking at this really um, wonderful um, and interesting volume. So, <clears throat> Beth, I was wondering about. You talked about the importance of this indexical information, right? Above the direction line, plants growing at Sir Thomas Willoughby's, right? Um, I'm wondering about the placement of this letter in the larger collection of letters and other, you know, what are, um, it looked like when you showed that initial slide that um, for Recto 242, there was some canceled pagination. So I'm wondering about the formation of this particular um, object with, you know, combined correspondence and letters. And if you could tell us a little more context around that particular object and when it was bound, you know, how do we know, et cetera? Yeah, so these are, these are all great questions. Um, it's a collection that includes letters that were written directly to Sloan, um, as well as letters that were between other figures as well. Um, so for example, there's a whole tranche of correspondence in this volume, the letters written from and to the physician Thomas Brown, um, who's you know, a whole generation earlier than Sloan in this time period. And so something, I'm, I'm not sure how he came across those, but he collected them at some point. <clears throat> but it also includes other letters that were written from members of the Willoughby family to Sloan 
himself, so more direct. Um, and in the catalog at the British Library, it's labeled as being miscellaneous correspondence connected mm -hmm. with Pettifer, but it's clear that that's not sort of the, the origins of it. Um, based on the way the endorsements, the endorsements are positioned on this and other letters, um, and also sometimes there are names attached to the endorsements, and those names are tied to um, secretaries and amanuenses who worked for Sloan uh, and also worked for the Royal Society. Um, the correspondence volumes um, have a really complicated history in that Sloan was reviewing material. Sometimes it was part of his personal collection. Sometimes it was verging into becoming part of the kind of public collection of the Royal Society, but it was sort of moving back and forth between those spaces. Hmm. Um, based on the position of the endorsement lines, I think most of the letters during his lifetime were stored folded up so that they could be sort of flipped through and kind of quickly indexed. And the creation of the guard books, I need to look into that history a little bit more in terms of the later history of cataloging cons conservation. Um, but there's a point in the 18th century in which the manuscripts, I think eight, late 18th, early 19th, in which the manuscripts and the printed books are separated out. And then the catalogs themselves, like the catalog is disbound and reorganized. So that when you look at Sloan's original catalog of his collection, um, there'll be a pages of it or leaves from it that have been separated into a catalog of printed books that's one volume and one that's manuscript books that's another volume but you might turn the page over on a leaf that's in the printed books catalog and see a list of manuscripts um, mm -hmm. because he kind of kept them together in his catalog but they they were separated out so yeah that's a great question thanks Beth and it looks like we have some additional questions in the chat so Jennifer writes uh, with a question. Have you published on this topic and where might I find this resource for further understanding and reading? Wonderful presentation. Thank you. Um, so I think the most recent thing um, that I've published that's related to this is in a collection that came out in 20, 2019, I think, um, with the University of Pittsburgh Press, and it was on um, paperwork and paper technologies in the history of science and medicine. Um, so that would be a great one, uh, maybe a good starting point. Okay. Great. Um, and then we have uh, Laura Mina uh, with another question. Were, the, were there any prominent American families and institutions Elizabeth came across in Willoughby's papers or in Sloan's records? Yeah, so that's a great question. So um, I haven't seen prominent American families in connection with Cassandra Willoughby's correspondence, um, which is not to say that it, there wasn't a connection, transatlantic connection there, but I haven't seen it. Um, but I have seen in looking with Sloan's correspondence and especially in the archives of the Royal Society, um, connections to American families. So there's a lot of correspondence or at least some correspondence between the Mather family, for example. So Cotton Mather writes some letters um, that are published in the Philosophical Transactions right around this time in the, the 1690s and the early 18th century. Um, and then of course, um, there's a number of other families uh, in Virginia, I think in particular, um, there might've been some exchanges with I think the Culpepper family in Virginia and a number of other figures. So they do show up from time to time um, and those networks cross the Atlantic. And of course, Sloan himself, you know, spending time in Jamaica uh, and the colonies there has those connections as well. Right, right, right. Thank you. Um, Maureen Bell um, says, great demonstration. And she follows up with a question, a small and base question, she says. But I wonder whether, assuming at the time postage, postage was paid by the recipient, its route via the East India Company was the family being stingy. Did they become received and paid for by the company, not the individual? And she puts in parentheses, I have late 18th century and early 19th century letters where people are advised to write via the company sometime because the individual recipient was traveling around, but perhaps a way of avoiding postage. Um, the question mark, exclamation mark. <laughs> That's a great question. I'm writing that one down because I want to track down exactly how the postage would have been paid um, if it would have been paid by the company instead of by the recipient in this case. Um, so I think my, my initial thought there is that it's possible to think about this in a multi-layered way. Um, that I think even if the family is being stingy and that would be highly compatible, compatible for sure with Josiah Child um, and the way he thinks about his investments of his time and of his money, right? And the reputation that he has uh, for being a very uh, avaricious merchant um, 
that the contents of the letter is still of great interest across multiple lines and multiple dimensions, right? Um, that it, the botanical interest, the idea of it being a kind of experimental plot, um, which lines up with some of the instructions that are given at the same time in the Royal African Company's records, um, that we can see these kind of points of intersection. Um, the other thing that, that I look to here as well is that some of the notes that I've seen in Cassandra Willoughby's correspondence and in other women's letters is that women are communicating with men through other women. Um, so you write to a wife, you write to a sister, you write to a mother as a way of then contacting or sharing information with a, a male relative in the family. Um, and Sloan does this as well. So for example, he writes to Cassandra to share news that he wants Thomas to have, the brother. Um, so for example, when Sloan has um, managed to finagle Thomas Willoughby's, Cassandra's brother's election to the Royal Society, he actually writes to Cassandra with the news and asks her to tell him. So those kinds of connections are there. And similarly, when eventually Cassandra marries um, the Duke of Chandos, who is an investor in the, the Royal African Company and the South Sea Company, um, she brokers connections between other women investors and her husband as well. So writing to the wife or writing to the mother or the sister was a way of reaching a male relative um, in this time period. So, so I think it could be multiple things, but I think Maureen, thank you for that question. Cause I think that's something I wanna investigate a little bit more. Yes, th and thank you for your response, um, Beth. Uh, we, have, we have more questions. Um, one coming from Benjamin Turnbull and he begins, thank you for this excellent presentation. How exactly were the names of plants from indigenous language, e.g. Nahuatl, transmitted to European botanists? You mentioned Spanish <laughs> sources, but could you provide more details? Yeah, that's a great question. So this is one of the reasons I wanted to take Spanish American text technologies earlier <laughs> this year was to try and figure this out a little bit more. So I'm also learning a lot about this as well. Um, but Couple of things. So by the time Sloan is copying out a lot of the names that might have Nahuatl or indigenous origins, um, he's working from other European printed sources largely. So he's studying um, Spanish herbals, Spanish natural histories um, and English natural histories and French ones as well. Um, some of them dating back into the 16th century. So he's building on kind of, you know, two centuries, right? At that point of engagement with, um, uh, not only the, the plants and, and the botany of the Americas and of Africa, but also with indigenous knowledge of, of their uses. Um, so he's kind of gleaning a, a little bit at, at second hand. Um, but a lot of what I've started to learn about this um, does show a lot of direct engagement of um, European naturalists and sometimes also naturalists who had both sort of European and indigenous descent as well. Um, some of whom within a Spanish context in sort of 16th century New Spain um, might've been kind of fairly high ranking within um, New Mexican society that was sort of becoming established within and in parallel to Spanish colonization. Um, publishing and writing on natural history in this time period, um, working with native informants. So as you know, the missionaries were active, uh, Catholic missionaries were active in, in Mexico. They're not only kind of collecting information about um, we're trying to disseminate information about the, the tenets of the religion, but also collecting a lot of ethnograph ethnographic and natural historical information. Um, so I've looked a lot, for example, at um, Jose de Acosta, who's a 16th century Spanish Jesuit, who's really interested in natural history and ethnographic practices. And I think gets a lot of it from kind of direct conversation and observation um, with indigenous figures. And Sloan is then relying on texts that were written by folks like de Acosta, right? And, and sometimes you can also see traces in English sources of, as well of direct engagement, conversation, um, observation of indigenous people they encountered. So for example, when one time when I was reading through Sloan's catalog of plants, I found this really puzzling description of a tree that seemed to put fish to sleep. And I just could not figure out what was going on there. So I went back and said, okay, Sloan sources, this English natural history and account of voyages from the early 17th century. So let's go check that. So I go back to that book and it turns out that that earlier English colonist had observed or seen or talked with Indians. And I think it was basically sort of around Suriname or Guiana in Northern South America, um, who had a particular tree that had a chemical in it that would stun the fish when it went into the water, basically. <laughs> and so it really was a tree that put fish to sleep. So there's this process of you know interaction, but then 
dissemination through the printed books. Thank you, thank you. Um, uh, we have another question, um, actually a number of them. So we won't be able to fit them all in, but I'm just gonna continue. We have a few more minutes um, and hoping that everyone will be able to join our speaker um, after we, um, what, what, as a second half to this, to this uh, um, event. Uh, but let's see if we can work one more in here. Um, so we have a question from Hilda who asks, and I think this is with respect to Thomas Willoughby, was his family connected to Francis Willoughby, governor of Barbados, 1650, and colonizing Suriname did, um, Suriname, sorry, and colonizing Suriname, did plants come via that route? Yeah, so that's a great, a great question. Um, in terms of the personal family connection to the Francis Willoughby, who was the governor of Barbados, I think it's likely, I need to look into that a little bit more closely, um, that I'd focus mainly on sort of the, the figure the family calls Francis the naturalist, which is yeah. Cassandra's father. Um, but I think that connections are likely to be found there. Um, and in terms of colonizing Suriname, that's a really, really interesting question. So um, one of the images that I showed was from the naturalist Maria Sil Sibylla Marion's um, description of the insects of Suriname, which Marion is a, a German born artist um, who lived in the Dutch colony of Suriname for a couple of years, right around the same time as we're talking about kind of late 1680s, um, 1690s. And Natalie Zeman Davis has written a great book that has a, a biography um, of, of Marion, if you're interested in her. And she made images. She talked again with um, Indian and with enslaved women in Suriname um, to learn about the uses of plants. So the knowledge, for example, that the peacock flower seeds could be used as an abortifacient. Um, she talks about gleaning that directly from her conversations with um, Indian women who are enslaved as well as African women who are enslaved. Um, and Marion herself also uh, enslaved, had, had held slaves uh, of, of her own um, in, in the time she was in Suriname. So she was not outside that system, just like Cassandra Willoughby was also not outside that system. And so um, Marion, when she returns, um, as do many others, uh, one of the goals would be to take back dried and pressed specimens, um, all the images and pictures that you had made, um, and, and seeds as well. And so th the way these sort of networks function is folks like Marion, folks like Pettiver, who I mentioned, um, Sloan, one of the goals of traveling um, to these places is to build up a stock or a collection that you can then come back and use as currency. And of course, plants are not likely to survive. Living plants are not likely to survive the transatlantic voyage. And so if you can return with seeds um, to see if they could be planted, if they could be propagated uh, in Europe is one of the goals there. Well, um, I know there are more questions. I'm hoping that, again, um, those tuning in will join our speaker. But before we, before we pivot to Gather Town and to um, a presentation we have about how to join Gather Town, I do want to um, give a round of applause for our speaker um, and for her talk. And um, I see lots of applause here, um, at least iconically <laughs> and virtually. So thank you again, Beth. Um, it was a pleasure having you with us and sharing your, your work with us. And I'm sure that there will be a lively com conversation to follow.